Thanks, Anna. I'd like to start by thanking Carol for setting this up. I always enjoy these activities, the laser and last activities, because uh, they give me a chance to connect my work to a broader context. When we go give talk to other science groups or whatever, we usually end up narrowing down what we talk about. So it's really nice to be at a symposium with such an interesting and broad topic like engineering the future, uh, the sciences that are shaping the 21st century. So with that title, or that symposium title, I decided to focus on Mars. Um, and the reason I decided to focus on Mars is because in the 21st century we might be doing stuff on Mars. So here, here are some of the, here are postcards from some of the interesting uh, events that, that relate to Mars. Of course there's the movie, The Martian. Uh, I hope you've all seen it. It's a wonderful uh, representation of astronauts on Mars. They are on Mars in 2035. Uh, there's also Mars One, a private company that's proposing to send astronauts on one-way trip to Mars in 2027. And they have a short list of candidates and everything. Uh, there's also SpaceX, a new and important uh, aerospace company whose founder uh, Elon Musk is convinced that he wants to go to Mars and stay. Uh, and then, of course, NASA uh, says that they're going to go to Mars in the 2030s. And as a NASA employee, I have to accept that as, as correct. You could think that all of these are really just fiction, uh, except the NASA one, of course. Uh, NASA isn't sure we're going to land on Mars in the 2030s, so our artist conception only has us orbiting Mars. But there's plans. To go to Mars, and Mars seems to be in the in the dialogue. And uh, there's also long-term discussions, or discussions about long-term uh, activities on Mars, and the idea of terraforming, going from Mars as it is today back to the way Mars was three and a half billion years ago, or also forward. And these are all part of engineering the future. In this case, by reconstructing the past. And these may be steps on the way. So that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about uh, uh, what, what's involved in these. And obviously, I'm not going to go into detail in a 25-minute talk, but I'll start with a real quick motivation on why Mars is interesting and what we know about it. A one-slide planetary science course on Mars. And then I'll talk a little bit about the results from Curiosity, since that's the rover on Mars. And then I'll jump into the technology. So here's the one slide history of Mars. It used to look like Earth. That's the most important thing we know about Mars, and the really the root reason why it's interesting to us. It used to look like Earth, uh, and, but it's smaller. And that makes a difference. Being smaller means no plate tectonics, less gravity, no magnetic field, and that's why it doesn't look like Earth now. Size matters. You hear it on TV, and it's true on planets, too. Uh, what are the questions we're interested in on Mars? We're asking, I think, three fundamental questions, and they're different questions. One is, did Mars have life in the past, and was that life different from Earth life? That is a science question. And if that was the only question we were interested in on Mars, I would not advocate sending humans. You don't need humans to do science on Mars. Uh, they, they could be useful, but it's not clear they're worth the cost. But that's not the only question we're asking. The other question we're asking is, the question is, is Mars a place where humans can live and work? Well, to answer that question, you actually do have to send humans. You can't determine whether humans will like a place and can live and work there without sending them there. Right? So this question is intrinsically a human question. Uh, you may say, well, why would we want to live and work on Mars? Well, why would we want to live and work in Palo Alto? Uh, Silicon Valley in general is not the most habitable place you can imagine, right? But why would we want to live and work anywhere? Humans want to live and work. That's what we do. Uh, we will do it everywhere we can go. Uh, and then the third question is the long-term question, does Mars have a biological future? This question is, did Mars have a biological fast, past? The other question is, does Mars have a biological future? And that's a very interesting question. It's got to do with, it has to do with what are we going to do? Uh, humans live and work. We're going to work, 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 work. What are we working toward? What's the long, once we 
achieve rough equality on Earth and world peace, etc., etc., what do we do next? Uh, just sit around and play video games? Uh, that's the image of the strong AI people. We turn into smart machines and we all just sit around and play video games. I reject that view. I don't even let my kids play video games. We go outside. <laughs> and for us, outside is Mars. Mars is the equivalent culturally or civilization-wise of going outside instead of staying home and playing video games. Okay, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of my story, but I just had a long, interesting discussion as I was sitting in the audience about why are we going to Mars. And this is important. Uh, so a little bit about searching for life. Why is it so interesting is because we might find life that's not related to us. We might find aliens, and Mars is the first place we'll search, and that could be really cool. Curiosity is our big mission on Mars right now. I spend a good deal of my time, or at least that's what I tell my, my boss, I spend a good deal of my time analyzing the data from this spacecraft, from this mission. Uh, this is an image from the most interesting site we studied on Mars. And if you look at this image, you can see why Mars calls us. This looks like a lot of places you've seen on your drive to Las Vegas, right? You can easily imagine this being a place like Earth. Mars has landscapes that we can recognize and are familiar with. It's the only world in our solar system that really has these sort of Earth-like landscapes with familiar looking rocks and distant hills and haze in the background. There's really a lot of places on Mars that look like home. It really calls to us in a way that no other world, not even the moon, with its airless sharp shadows, calls us. Uh, and I think that's why we spend more on Mars than all the other planets put together. In fact, there was a time when we were crashing more spacecraft on Mars than sending to all the other planets. It's because it has landscapes that call us. Uh, and in this landscape, we drilled two holes, and we made, I think, a very important discovery. And this is now my favorite place on Mars because it used to be a lake, and we found the sediments on the bottom of the lake. So we're in a crater, rovers in a crater, was full of water three and a half billion years ago. After that water went away, those sediments at the bottom of the crater of the lake, and the mud on the bottom of the lake got compacted into mudstone. Not volcanic rocks, but mudstone. And then these mudstones were exposed 70 million years ago. A perfect site for astrobiology. It's an analog site here in Antarctica, what might have been happening in that lake on Mars billions of years ago. So this is not Antarctica, this is Mars three and a half million years ago. Very, very cold, ice covered. This is the lake, it's ice. This is our camp, by the way. Um, and we study in this lifeless, dry environment, which most of Mars would have been, even when it was wet. Uh, we drill through the ice. You can see the main reason I go on these trips is because I'm tall enough to reach the uh, height and equipment, study what's going on in there, and cut a hole in the ice and dive in the water Below, this is uh, our first trip there, uh, and look at the life beneath that ice. So underneath a layer of ice three meters thick, in a cold, dry, and lifeless part of Antarctica, there's a body of water, and in that water, there's microorganisms living on the bottom of that. And these are analogs for early Earth and Mars. The lake on Gale Crater might have been populated with this sort of ecosystem. And so the mud on the bottom of this lake would preserve evidence of this lake. Maybe this has happened on Mars as well. So these are that, those mudstones. This is that site on Mars, Yellowknife Bay, that I showed you earlier. Uh, this is the site that was labeled John Klein. These stones are mudstones that were deposited in a lake three and a half million years ago. Now that just amazes me. It's the first place on Mars we've been able to point to mudstones or anything sedimentary. And even better, we were able to drill into it. And when we drilled into it, it turned from red to gray. You say, well, is that really the level of sophistication that you guys work at? Yeah, it really is. Red to gray. And that's really big news. Red to gray. And I don't think I'm going to show you the data, but the gray stuff smell like hydrogen sulfide, like rotten eggs, when it was heated up. The rich anaerobic stuff. Uh, we knew that Mars was gray from the meteorites, but this was the first time we'd seen it on Mars. And in those sediments, despite difficulties with the equipment, uh, and despite the perchlorate in the soil, uh, the team was able to detect Martian organics in that gray stuff. 
Now, these organics have, probably have nothing to do with life. They're probably meteoritic organics, but it's the first step on the way to search for life on Mars. Very cool. That's the main result of that's what we're doing right now. That's your tax dollars at work. Uh, now, let's go to the future. Humans go. Uh, here's an artist's conception, obviously, of what uh, a human base might look like. In the spirit of this conference, I want to talk about the technologies, the engineering of the future. What are the technologies that will enable that image? And I'm focusing on technologies that NASA will not develop, but that we will benefit from the rest of the technological world developing. Uh, for example, non-fossil fuel energy systems. There's no fossil fuels on Mars. We can't drill for oil. So we need non-fossil fuel energy systems. Well, it turns out we're, we're interested in those on Earth, too, or at least we should be. Uh, preferably solar. Uh, it's much easier to fix a solar system on Mars than, say, a nuclear system or even a wind system. Uh, we need ro remote and robotic construction and maintenance. We, need, uh, we, we, we just won't have enough people to do everything that needs to be done. We need smarter uh, robots that can be remotely operated from Earth or that can just know what to do without us having to take help. Uh, the images of a Mars base where the crew is doing all the work, like they do on space station, is just not realistic. Uh, Self-driving cars is my favorite uh, topic that category. Why don't we have them yet? What's the problem here, folks? Uh, another technology, 3D printing on demand of equipment and parts. You can't bring the warehouse to Mars. You bring a, a bunch of goo and you print the parts you need. That's technology that's being developed on Earth for Earth reasons. Uh, my favorite is a 10-person home size, that's the size of the base, water recycling system. Uh, faster, better, cheaper computers. There's a little footnote here about faster, better, cheaper in the history of NASA, but that's kind of inside baseball I won't go into. It. it is possible to do faster, better, and cheaper, and computers are the proof that it's possible. It's called Moore's Law. And of course, self-growing food, uh, something that we have on Earth and we want to have on Mars too. That's where nature has done the technology. We need these technologies to make that image possible and affordable. The reason we're not going to Mars now, in the, in the way it's portrayed in the movie The Martian, is because those technologies that are employed in that scenario are way too expensive and too fragile. Uh, these technologies allow us to be simpler, cheaper, and more robust. Uh, so here's smart machines. They're being developed on Earth for construction, for demolition, for bomb removal, for a variety of reasons, remote and automatic machines. Self-driving cars is one of my, the car technology is one of my favorite examples. Here's vehicular technology on Mars now. 100 watts, $2 billion. Now to be fair, the $2 billion includes delivery and dealer prep. And that's probably about a billion of it right there. But still, it's expensive. Now, a Toyota Corolla puts out 100 kilowatts, uh, and it's about $20,000. That's great, but they won't work on Mars. No fossil fuel, no air. Right? Well, a Tesla, it's hard to give it an energy site because it's an electric car. It's not quite the same as these systems, which have fixed energy and then you turn it into torque with the transmission. But uh, roughly, it can put out 300 kilowatts and it's 100K. That electric car would work on Mars. A Tesla will drive on Mars. Right? Uh, it doesn't need air, and it doesn't need fossil fuel. Uh, and if we can make it self-driving, even better. So we see these self-driving cars around. I try to avoid them because they follow the speed limit and obey the traffic rules. <laughs> How obnoxious is it for the other drivers to do that? Right? Uh, on Mars, that won't be a problem. There aren't any speed limits. Uh, here's, here's another favorite. Uh, the Gates Foundation project Reinvent the toilet. If you haven't heard of this, go Google it. It's a wonderful uh, project where they're basically saying, we've got to move away from a technology where we put potable drinking quality water into a toilet and then flush that out, flush the toilet with that, and take all those valuable organics and just throw them into the waste stream. Uh, how, how wasteful can that be? It's wasteful on both ends. Uh, so they're saying, let's reinvent the toilet, let's take that logic to the extreme, let's imagine a house which completely recycles its water. 
Uh, there's no water in, no water out, it's just recycled. Uh, it's easily possible, it would be handy on Earth, and it would be useful technology on Mars. The point is that a lot of the things we're going to need on Mars, we need to develop on Earth for reasons that have to do with sustainability on Earth. The fundamental challenge on Mars is sustainability. We are facing that challenge on Earth, sustainability. So let's apply the same technology. 3D printing of equipment, NASA for the first time is starting to print rocket engines. This was 3D copper printing. Uh, greatly changes the concept of the supply chain and parts and reliability and so on. These are the technologies engineering the future as the conference is entitled. Uh, so let's talk now, we've got humans on Mars, I just want to put a plug in for what are they going to do. What I want them to do is drill. That's one thing humans do really good. Uh, the hypothesis is that life arose on Mars, separate from Earth. It's still there in ice. It's dead. There's nothing alive on Mars. It's dead due to radiation. But we will decide to reconstruct it. And in fact, where would we go? This is the site on Mars we would drill to find this ancient frozen life. I'm not going to go into detail. This is a map of Mars, but we know where to go. Uh, we know why they'd be dead from radiation, uh, billions of years of radiation. The bottom line is the important one. It's dead, Jim. Uh, <laughs> but dead for a microorganism is not the same problem. So this is a purchase order I put into NASA's Sin Bio Department. And I hope Drew will mention it. Uh, I want the geniuses in the Sin Bio Group to reconstruct Martian life from the fragments preserved in the polar ice. Uh, and uh, they'll have time to do it. We won't get the samples to them until 2035, <laughs> and they need to complete the work by 2040. But this is a scientific challenge that we will face on Mars that ties to technology being developed today. NASA isn't going to learn how to do this. The Sin Bio groups are going to learn how to do this, and then we will just hire them. So we are outsourcing this important job, right? Uh, reconstructing Martian life from the fragments preserved in the polar ice. How exciting would that be? And you'll need the humans there to get those samples. So why bother doing that? Well, fundamental ethical principles about having diverse life, benefits that come from studying life, and it's just a cool thing to do. You know, put on our resume. You know, we, we finally meet the aliens and they say, what have you done? Well, we could say, well, we went to the nearby planet and we restored the life that was there. Don't we get a gold star for that? Right? That's a lot better than we invented video games and just sat home and played them. Right? I don't mean to harp on video games. Uh, okay, now the final theme here is the long, long-term vision of Mars. The idea that Mars once had oceans and maybe life, and we could bring it back. And in a paradoxical way, the fundamental challenge of bringing Mars back to life is the challenge of warming up planets. Well, we know how to warm up planets. We are demonstrating it on Earth. And in fact, we can easily apply the same approach on Mars. And it turns out, in a hundred years or less, you can warm up Mars. It's not breathable. You can't really make oxygen. But you can warm up the planet, and life could be there. Humans would still be the source of oxygen. So here's Mars today. Here's Mars maybe in a hundred years. Do you see, do you see the difference? Right? Uh, and you say, well, what's the, why are we doing this? I would argue that the reason for doing it is life. Life going out, doing something, supporting life in the universe, enhancing the richness and diversity of life. And this is a calculation from the paper on what kind of gases we would make in the atmosphere to do it. We would learn the lessons from Earth not to use chlorine and bromine, uh, to use gases that don't destroy ozone, etc. Uh, and again, we turn to our SynBio group for making organisms that could do things on Mars that we don't need done on Earth. Right? So in this case, I want the SynBio group to construct a microorganism that eats the perchlorate in the soil, reacts it with iron, and produces organic material. Right? And can survive high UV and low temperatures. That's a reasonable thing for an organism to do. They don't do it on Earth because there's no niche for this but they would have a niche if they could do it on Mars. And that's where synthetic biology can be powerful on Mars, is because there are conditions there that have no analogs on Earth, and so organisms can be, in a sense, taught to do it. Uh, other things that we might ask from our synthetic bio friends is organisms that can do other things like super weathering, organic producers, organisms that make wood, microorganisms that make wood. On Earth, only trees make wood. 
And what is a very useful compound because it is carbon and hydrogen without nitrogen and phosphorus. So you tie up carbon without tying nutrients. And so if you can bury a lot of wood, you make the oxygen in the atmosphere go up. And you don't do it at the expense of the nutrient cycles. Uh, and of course, they, they, uh, greenhouse gases and fixed nitrogen. Uh, why do all this? One reason could be just completely Earth-centric. We want, uh, this goes to a quote taken off Feynman, Richard Feynman on his blackboard, what I cannot create, I do not understand. Well, what, what is this referring to in this context? Well, here, you could argue that the motivation for all of this activity on Mars is really just to understand the Earth and to put us in a better position to manage and protect the Earth. I think that's a valid motivation. A separate motivation, which I would submit, is also to expand life beyond the Earth. Both should come into the uh, equation. Now, I want to turn back from the distant future to the immediate next step, that well, something that we're working on, which is plants. When we go, we will take plants with us. Uh, if you're just going somewhere for a week, you don't take your plants. You know you're going somewhere to stay when you load up all your plants and take them with you, right? So when we go to Mars, we'll take plants. In fact, we'll send them first. So we're pushing a concept to grow a plant on Mars. Now, this is a little bit of an artist's representation. We don't really have a bell jar with a rose in it. The botanists who have no sense of aesthetics won't let us use a rose. They want to grow a little tiny uh, mustard seed plant called Arabidopsis because it's scientifically interesting, but that's okay. The concept is we will grow something on Mars first that's not a human being. The first earthling on Mars will almost certainly not be human, it will be a plant. Uh, and this is a wonderful quote from a short story by Rogers Lassen. There has never been a flower on Mars. She said, she is the queen of Mars. But we will learn to grow them. And that, in my mind, is the first step that humans will contribute to understanding how life can, or if, spread beyond the Earth. Can we grow a flower on Mars? And this slide is intentionally left blank, and that's my key to stop talking and maybe open up for questions if that's the format you want to run. And then we'll see you on.